Is this the dagger? Oh! Illegal substitution. Too many men on the field. Saskatchewan. Gizmo has a block and the sideline. He has not stepped out. He may go all the way. He needs one block and he'll do it easily. Promise me I wouldn't do this. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores. Hey, it's the Outsiders, powered by the Macintosh Group at Remax River City. It's Podcast 95. My name's Bryn Griffiths. Robin Brownlee joining us. How you doing, Robin? I'm outstanding, Bryn. Well, really looking forward to this one today because joining us is the new Assistant General Manager for the Edmonton Elks of the CFL, a guy that you and I watched play and then watched his uh, career blossom away from the game, behind the scenes. G. Roy Simon joining us. How you doing? I'm great. How's it going with you guys? Fine, thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's let's get going on the elk stuff, and then we'll kind of backtrack a little bit here. Assistant general manager for the football club. What are you going to be looking after, G. Roy? Um, I'm I'm going to be basically Chris's right hand man. I'll, I'll be you know handling a lot of contracts. Um, you know, dealing with the salary cap, um, watching watching budgets, helping with personnel, kind of kind of all all the the all encompassing. Uh, duties as as a general manager, assistant general manager, and, and, and as well as some scouting. So you get to do the the heavy lifting while Chris wears the sunglasses on the sidelines. Is that how that's <laughs> going to work then? Yeah, he, he he does he does quite a, quite a lot of lifting himself. So I just I'm just there as as a support. <laughs> G. Roy, I've I've got to ask. Hall of Fame career as a receiver. Uh, all those years you spent uh, paying your dues in the front office with the, with the lions. I thought for sure, if ever anybody was going to end up as uh, a GM, there, a former player, it would be G Roy Simon. Here you are in Edmonton with a terrific franchise, but that's a disconnect for me. How did G Roy Simon go from a natural fit, at least in my books in BC <laughs> joining the Edmonton Elks? What happened here? You know, I think I think it was just one of those things where everybody else on the outside saw me as a, as the next and up and coming GM in BC, but BC didn't see it that way. So, um, in actuality, it was it was you know it, it was just time for me to leave. Um, I, I felt like my career was in a stalemate in, in BC, and and um, it, it was just time for me to, to move on and and um, you know find a new opportunity. And, and thankfully, Chris gave me the opportunity. You know, we've been friends for quite a long time, even when I was a player. Um, and you know, we we talked often. Um, you know, when when he was you know at various spots. Um, and, you know, when he got this opportunity, he called me as soon as he got hired and, and told me that he wanted me to come with him. G. Roy, when did you when did you see the writing that you just described on the wall, so to speak? When did you go, OK, I'm in the front office. I'm working in this uh, global scouting position for B.C. Mm-hmm. You weren't doing that just for the heck of it it looked like there was going to be an end game there. It didn't turn out that way. When did you realize it wasn't going to turn out that way? Um, I think at the end of probably, probably at the end of uh, the 2018, 20, the beginning of 2019 season, I kind of felt like um, things were, you know, getting stagnant on me. Um, I wasn't progressing and doing the things that, that I needed to be doing to, to learn, um, you know, to, to, to become a GM uh, moving forward. And, you know, that was, that was um, that was just you know it, it, I I, I kind of felt it um, you know when when Ed Herbert was was the GM there um, you know he although I would I was doing a lot I still wasn't progressing in in the manner that I thought I should be progressing and moving in the in the direction that 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 I felt that um, was was taking me in 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 that direction so I knew that. Um, I, I basically started that transition um, as, as early as 2019. So what excites you the most about coming in here this season, <clears throat> other than the fact you're coming into minus 24 degree weather? <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing that the most excites me is, you know, I've always heard 
you know, how great an organization Edmonton has, has been and, and is. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really excited to get, to get to town and, and, um, you know, get in the office and, and, and meet the people. And, and, you know, you know, I, I've obviously been doing work here from here in, in British Columbia, but um, I'm really excited to get to Edmonton and, and really get to work um, and, and work with the fine people and in, in the office every day and, and work in the community. I have to ask, do you watch defense as closely now as you, you, you know, watch offense when you played? I know that you still had to beat those the DBs at the back, but uh, now you got to worry about signing guys who are playing on the other side of the football. You know, the funny thing is, I, I think, you know, at being a receiver all the years, um, I think my the, the position that I watch more than anything is offensive line. Um, and, you know, because I, I just, I always feel like, um, you know, if you don't have an offensive line, you don't have a chance to win. Obviously, if you don't have a quarterback, but, you know, I've, I've been around quarterbacks for, you know, my, my entire football life. So um, I can, I can figure out if a quarterback can play or not uh, pretty quick, but offensive and defensive line are, are my, I, I think, two positions that I, I think that, you know, I, I, um, I watch quite a bit because, you know, if, if you can't, again, if you can't control the line of scrimmage, you, you don't have a chance to win. G Roy, uh, maybe <clears throat> this is specific to Chris Jones or the situation here in general. What sold you that Edmonton right now at this, at this point in your career is the right choice for you um, that you want to be here? Well, I, I know that um, the the thing that sold me is is Chris. Um, Chris has has been um, he's been a guy that that goes to goes to different places and, and helps rebuild. Um, he's 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 a winner. Um, you know, he's won basically everywhere he's been. Mm -hmm. um, he's a tireless worker. Um, and, and I wanted to experience um, his work ethic. I, I know the way that I work and, you know, you know, being on the road with him, um, you know, working beside him each and every day um, is, is, is a great experience for me. Um, I'm learning quite a bit about the types of players that, that win uh, the types of, um, uh, guys make up, um, mentally and physically how they, how, how they can help you win. So, um, it's, it's been, it's been quite a ride so far and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to getting into the season and, and seeing how this all comes together. One of the things that's happened here over the past two years has been a disconnect between the community and the football club, but you've been involved in the community everywhere you've gone. Uh, talk about how important that is to you. It's, it's more than just throwing the football, catching the football, running with it. You, you have to, you have to identify with your fan base a little bit. That's to me, this is where you've been very strong and that's a really huge positive for the football team here. Yeah, I think um, it's 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 always been a natural thing for me to be in the community, um, to you know, to find areas of need and, and trying to um, fill some of those gaps. Um, you know, I've you know my thing, my um, my reputation in the community has has been very good because all the things that I've done, um, all the kids that I've helped, um, you know, go to university and and play university football, um, and it's funny because. And in, in the next year, I'll be drafting some of the some of the players that I've coached um, as as early as when when they were eight years old. Wow! So um, it's it's going to be um, something that comes full circle. Um, but you know, I think I think that you know the CFL is unique, and and um, you know you know as as players as as executives. You know, we're we're in the community more. Um, we're um, people where people are able to, able to walk up to us and talk to us and touch us and and and, and get to know us. Um, so it's it's I think it's it's really important because the the fan base, the community is the backbone of of our organizations, and 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 we have to you know we have to have that connection. One other thing I wanted to touch on too is you were on a panel with the CFL Black History Month. That's another area that that the league is trying to expand and work with. You got to be proud of being involved with a group like that. And think of the things you can do, man. 
Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, you, you got to have that conversation, you know, um, about, you know, hiring practices, hi, um, you know, diversity in, in, in not only the CFL, but in sport in general. Um, you know, it's, it's important to, um, to hire black co- coaches and black executives, but also women, um, indigenous people of, in, in, uh, from in, in indigenous cultures, um, because it's all about inclusion. Um, you know, when, when we put those helmets on, when we put those jerseys on, it doesn't matter, you know, what color you are, but you know, there's every, every, you know, there's a different makeup of, of people. So, um, it's, it's important to, um, to, to, you know, to acknowledge, um, diversity and, 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 and continue to practice it. G Roy, I'll paraphrase this, this question by letting you know that, I am so old. Uh, I was going to St. Thomas More in uh, Burnaby uh, when Louis Pisaglia was playing across town. Um, he was a couple years older than me, but not by much. I was also a kid at Empire Stadium when <laughs> Warren Moon was still playing for the Eskimos. Um, and they had a receiver there. I've seen a couple of guys live with my own eyeballs. Mervin Fernandez and Jim Young. I always thought those two guys were the greatest receivers the BC Lions ever had. But now as an adult, I look at the books and go, this G. Roy Simon guy, he's got more yards than anybody who ever played the game, not just with the Lions, but in the Canadian Football League. What... (laughs) What do you know, having been a part of that franchise about Dirty 30 and Mervyn Fernandez? And when you look back at those guys, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, those are two guys that, um, that you know, they're, they're two great players in the history of the BC Lions. Um, I got a chance to meet uh, Jim Young um, a few times, uh, especially early in my career in, in, in BC. And, and, you know, he was a heck of a player. He was tough. He was, he was gritty. Um, he did all the things that, that, um, that you want out of a, out of a receiver back in, back in those days. And then uh, Mervin Fernandez, I got a chance to meet him later in my career. And, you know, he was big, he was fast. Um, obviously he played in the NFL for quite a bit and, if he would have spent his entire career um, in, in, in Canada, those records that I have would have been a lot harder to beat. Um, you know, two, two great men, um, two great um, players in, in BC Lions history. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm just honored to, to have had the opportunity to, to, to break records um, that, that they had. I've got to ask you who your, uh, your sports hero was growing up. Was it a football guy, a basketball guy? Who? Yeah, so I had a few. Um, obviously, my um, you know Walter Payton was my first um, you know guy that I really looked up to when when I was playing. Um, Michael Jordan. Um, I'm a huge basketball fan. Um, I actually wanted to play college basketball instead of football, but football came a little easier to me than uh, than than the basketball. Um, and you know, just you know, those two guys were were really instrumental in in my development as far as. Uh, the type of type of athlete I wanted to be because they were tough. You know, they didn't take days off. You know, they were con- consummate workers, consummate pros, um, and always came to came to work and, and 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 played at a high level. Now, what position did you play in in basketball? Were you a point guard, a shooting guard, what? Yeah, so I was a point guard, um, but I was a, I was a high flying point guard. Um, you know, I was you know I didn't have a consistent jump shot, but um, I was I was pretty aggressive. You know, I was I was that typical football player that that plays that plays basketball, fearless. Um, you know, I, I you know I feel like I can jump over anybody. I can I can do any dunk that Michael Jordan did. Um, and, and I was the one that would, that would even try it in a game. Um, so, you know, I, I was, I was really aggressive as, as a player, um, on the basketball court. G Roy, I know some guys aren't that comfortable talking about themselves, but you get into football, uh, you know, the numbers speak volumes. You don't lead the a league in career receiving yards by accident. You know, there's other guys. Milt Stiegel, he was a killer finisher. He leads in career touchdowns. What did you, what was your best attribute uh, 
as a receiver because Brent and I were talking. There were a couple of, of great receivers here in Tommy Scott and Brian Kelly, mm-hmm. and they were the least athletic guys you would ever see, but they knew how to run a route. Wow. They mm-hmm. knew how to do the job, and they're mentioned by a lot of people too. What did you bring to the table? I think my my biggest attribute was um, was consistency and, and toughness. Um, not only physically toughness, but but mental toughness. Um, I felt that um, my knowledge of the game and and, and constant uh, work ethic, you know, helped me to uh, to to stay consistent and 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 constantly be on the field. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty proud to say that I played almost. I, I think I think it was 98 straight games without without uh, missing a game. Um, and I think you know some most times availability is your best ability and I, I think that my mental toughness especially at the end of games and at the end of at, at the end of um in in, in in tough situations was was something that that I really thrived on you know a lot of guys you know come up to me and, and when they were younger you know and then they talk about when they were younger in the league and they would come up to me and say something to me and I wouldn't say anything in the first half but you know come the third fourth quarter you know they 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 see a different a different side of me um just because I knew that um, at the end of games, that's when that's when the money's made, and that's when you know your stars have to be stars. And I, and I was I was conscious of that, and, and really thrived on on being a guy that that can finish games. I'm always kind of curious to know how guys got to where they were. How did you get to the University of Maryland? Is there a story there? Well, um, actually, um, there was. There was a few reasons why I went to the University of Maryland because where I'm from, uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm right in between University of Pittsburgh and, and Penn State. And everybody in my family either, it's it's kind of split. Half are Penn State fans, half are Pitt fans. And, right. and I actually wanted to go to Pitt. But I went to the University of Maryland because a couple of reasons. One, they ran the run and shoot, so I knew I'd catch a ton of balls. I played I played in the run and shoot when I was, when I was in high school. Um, and two, um, you know, University of Maryland is the number one school in the country for uh, criminal justice. I, I, you know, I was, I, I was, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in the police, you know, in the police force, FBI, Secret Service. But I knew that if, if I went to University of Maryland to, uh, studying criminal justice, that I'd have a great opportunity to, uh, to, you know, to, to be on one of those forces. I got to jump in on that one because I, now, now we're learning something about you. So what made you want to go down that road? Like, I, I gotta ask, like the criminal <laughs> justice route, like what happened there? Like how'd you get started? Well, what made you think about it? I'm from, I'm where I'm from. It's pretty, it's a pretty rough place. Um, a lot of crime, a lot of, a lot of drugs. Um, so I, you know, I always, again, it goes back to wanting to help the community and want, wanting to be a force in the community. Um, and, and, you know, I felt like if I was on a police force or a secret service, I could, I could help, you know, you know, lessen the crime in, in, in my area. So you could have ended up catching bad guys instead of catching football. Yeah, you know it's funny because you know I had I you know one of my I, I've had teammates who were in the FBI. Some some guys work in Secret Service and and you know they you know it's funny because I'll go back for homecoming and you know everybody talks about what do you do and some guys will, they will not tell you what their job is because they're they're not allowed um i had a, another one of my former teammates protect george bush um as as a secret service agent so it's 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 been it's been pretty cool to hear some of the stories of of some of the things that they do um and and some of their experiences do you regret it that maybe you didn't follow that up after your football career was done? Or are you you're happy? Mm-hmm. Look at what you've done with development and, and teaching mm-hmm. kids and, <laughs> and, and bringing up. I mean, I, I think it's been a great, uh, a great move for you. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't regret it at all. I, you know, I, I, you know, so my, you know, one thing I'm proud of is that I've never shot a gun in my life and, and, you know, for as many guns as I've been around and, 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 you know, uh, on the, on the legal side and the, and the illegal side, I've never shot a gun. And I, I want to continue that, continue that streak. <laughs> G. Wright, looking ahead with what you'll be doing here in Edmonton, uh, transition from player to front office 
what about what about this appeals most to you when you go to work now uh, as an AGM or in your in your past position uh, in a scouting role? What about that intrigues you? Well, I, th- I think the thing that most that most intrigues me intrigues me is 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 helping build a team and, and building a winning organization. Um, I, I'm you know I'm 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 boots on the ground. I'm involved in every aspect, whether it's, you know, signing, you know, negotiating contracts, scouting players, you know, I'm, I'm out there looking, looking for, for talent all, all across North America and really across the world. And with the, with the global, uh, with the global players now. So, um, I'm, I'm boots on the ground. I'm, I'm helping building, I'm helping build from the ground up. And that's, that's what excites me. Um, you know, the, the, you know, when, when we're, when we're holding a great cup at, at the end of the year, it's all going to be worth it because, you know, I, I, I felt like I was a part of, I was a part of this thing from, from, from the bottom up. Speaking of the great cup, you won it three times. The first mm-hmm. one, 2006 with the lions, but that was a pretty big year for you. You're the outstanding player in the league. What do you remember about that year? I just remember everything going right. I mean, I you know from from the off season training to you know to you know we started a little bit slow. Um, I think we were two and two, but we always felt like um, we we had the team that can that can really uh, take it to the next level, and that's that's what we did. Um, the 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 thing that, that that excited me the most is not only that I win most outstanding player, but we swept the awards as as a as a as a team and organization, um, and then we went on to win and win the great cup in Winnipeg where I started my career. So um, I'm just proud of the fact that we were able to do it together um, as a, as a collective group. And, you know, you know, when I, I remember when I was on the stage, you know, receiving most outstanding player, I, I told my teammates, I share this with you guys because with, without them, I, you know, I couldn't have been on that stage. And, and it's something that that's, that I'm proud of that um, I was on, I was on a, a, on a team that was very dominant and, and, you know, I couldn't do that without, you know, the brothers that were, that were in that locker room. You're right. One of the things that's always been true about the CFL is it's a gate driven league. You need to get people into the stadium mm-hmm. With COVID, with the things that have happened, <clears throat> that's been a challenge. The other thing, and you know this because you're old enough, the, the your base of fans, you have to grow that base or you die. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to be more inclusive. It can't just be, I think as they put it here, uh, when they did some recent hires with with, uh, with Jones and and uh, Victor Kui, it can't just be a bunch of old white guys coming <laughs> come to the ballpark. So you're in the football ops. I know that you're not in the marketing end, but how different is it now when it comes to getting fans into the ballpark, appealing to them, broadening your base than it was say 20 years ago? Well, I think I, I, you know times are times are different, but um, I, I remember my first game with the BC Lions. There was twelve thousand fans there. We we played Toronto, and then my last game with the BC Lions, there was fifty five thousand. So it's it's about you know winning first. That's first and foremost. But you know the fans have to be able to identify with with some of the players, and I think we have to we have to market some of these guys. Um, not you know not just market the team, but market individuals. Um, but then also, you know, again, you know, we have to make it, we, we have to make it fun. We have to make games an event and we have to make, um, we, you know, whether we win or lose it, you know, fans have to have a great experience when they come to the ballpark. And I think we're putting together the team that can do that. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fast. And, 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 you know, you know, fans are going to get their money's worth. Um, now the way that with technology and things like that, I think, you know, you have to be able to, um, you have to make it cool for, for kids. You have to make it inclusive for kids. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times kids aren't looking up, they're looking down at their phones. So we have to find a way to, to use technology to, to, to lock these kids in and, and bring them to the, to, to the, uh, to the, to the stadium. Are you a tech guy? Like, are you, uh, are you ahead of the game? Or are you behind the game? Uh, how do you view yourself in that department? 
I think I'm kind of right, right in the middle. I'm not a, I'm not a huge tech guy, but I'm not, I'm also um, not illiterate. Um, you know, I, I try to, I try to keep up with, 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 uh, with technology. The good thing is I got, I still, I still have young kids that, that can, that can help me with that. Best marketing tools you can have are the kids at home. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Hey, I got to ask about your final season. You had a chance to play with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and we can talk about the BC Lions. We can talk about the Edmonton Eskimos or Elks all we want. But you had that one last year in Saskatchewan to kind of get a flavor of what that, that place is all about. What was that like for you, even though it was kind of coming to the end for you career-wise? Yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I you know, I kind of always envied um, the fans and, 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 you know, Saskatchewan as a whole because, you know, liver, you know win, or, win or lose, those guys – they always showed up. They were always rowdy. They always supported their team, no matter what. So when when I had the opportunity to search for a trade, you know, they, they were the first people I talked to. And then Brendan Taman was there. He's he's you know the guy that brought me into the league and still a good friend of friend of mine. Um, I, I just knew that I wanted to go to a place where football was number one. Um, you know, being in Vancouver for all the years and winning great cups, but you know, even though we're winning, we're going twelve and. 12 and 6, 13 and 5, you know, the talk was always about the Canucks. Um, yeah. So I wanted to go to a place where football was number one in, in, in the town. And, and you know, Saskatchewan gave me gave me that opportunity to come to town and help win, win did, a great cup. Did you notice there was a difference on the northeast sideline to the southwest <laughs> sideline too? Did you notice that at all? I know Gizmo yeah. did. Gizmo said that was a tough place to play. Yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, the, the funny thing is when, when I, when I got there on my, my initial press conference, I, I had a, we had an autograph signing right after and, um, a lady, it's, it's funny. I tell the story all the time. A lady, she's probably 75, 80 years old. And she walked up to me and she said, G Roy, I used to hate you, but now I love you because you're a writer. So it was, it was, it was something that really opened my eyes to, to the way that they are as fans, you know, they, they ride or die with their fans. And, and it was, it was a great experience. Well, G Roy, I mean, we had a, a, a pretty good hockey club here. Uh, with Gretzky and the Oilers in the '80s, and and oh, let's face it, hockey's still number one. But this is a this is a very passionate football town as well, as you know. Uh, great tradition here, winning tradition. Um, when you walk through that door to start your your first day of work, uh, um, what do you most look forward to here? Um, again, the the people. The people are, 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 are what's going to make this experience a great one for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know each and every person in the organization. Um, I'm a very inclusive person. Um, I like to I like to get to I like to you know sit down with people and talk to them and get to know them um, because you know we can all do our jobs, but if we don't know each other as people, if we don't care about each other as people, then then what are we really doing? Um, mm-hmm. So I think I think for me, you know, to be able to sit down with someone and, and get to know them, get to know about their family, get to know about their backgrounds, you know, that's that's how we we create true friendships and true relationships. So that's that's what um, I'm really looking forward to. Over 1,000 receptions. Is there one game when you played at Commonwealth that you remember, or they is it just a blur <laughs> for you now? I remember a game back in 2009. It was minus 17. Um, we, you know, we were winning the game and then we ended up, you know, uh, finding a way to, uh, to, to lose a lead. And I think about a minute and a half left, you know, I'm running a seam route and Buck Pierce, uh, throws me a seam route. I catch it, two guys run into each other and, you know, I, I run in for a touchdown to, to take the lead again. Um, that's the game that really stands out to me. Um, but, you know, I always felt Commonwealth was a very tough place to play. Um, you know, it seemed like the energy was was always in in, in, in Edmonton's favor. Um, but, you know, that, that was probably the game that, that, that really stands out for me um, in, in, in my career playing in Commonwealth. Well, I tell you, um, I've asked about everything I want to ask, but I do have to say this. I don't often try and sound like a fan because I've been a reporter for an awful long time, but uh, – one of my favorite things in sports, sometimes it's over the top, sometimes it's corny, and I know it's show business. 
That hands on the hips pose, man. <laughs> you just beat that me to the, that. That was the freaking best. I mean, <laughs> it was so, it was not frenetic. It was just there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was, how did you come up with that? Well, my you know I have my son Jaden. He was he was born um, in <laughs> at the at the uh, beginning of my career here in BC, um, and you know he he grew up loving Power Rangers and Batman and Superman. So you know, I, and he watched games with me all the time. So I always said that if if I score a touchdown, I'm going to do something to you know to show him that dad's a superhero. Every kid thinks their dad's a superhero. So I, I started doing it for him, and and you know said when I score when I did it, when I scored a touchdown and I ended up scoring a lot of touchdowns. So I just kept kind of, kind of doing it and it caught on. So I just, I just kept doing it the rest of my career. I am so jealous that you asked that question, Robin, and very proud of you at the exact same time, Robin, for asking that question. Are you going to be doing that pose around the office if something big happens? <laughs> no, the, the pose got retired when I retired. Okay, so, all right. Um, you know, I, I do it every once in a while, but not you know, not not so much anymore. Hey, listen, we know you got to get to a football ops meeting. Thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you during the season. Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, G. Ray. Damn, you just beat me to that question. I'm going to say, okay, what's up with the thing? It's one of my favorite questions. Oh, oh, what's up? Yeah, yeah. That's a Larry King one. What's up with the thing? <laughs> wow. It is, you know, you see all these things, though, over the years, right? And sometimes you smirk because they're clever, or sometimes you go, oh, come on, man, let's not get carried away. Act like you've been there before. Everybody knows that maneuver, the thing with the hands on the hips and the... <laughs> it's perfect. You can't say it's over the top. You can't see he's not showing anybody up. Yeah. He's not, point, he's not pointing at anybody. He's just, <laughs> he's just I love it. Hey, hey, you know what? There was only one way to stop that, and you, the problem is you couldn't stop it. That was yeah. the problem. So, wow. <laughs> Well, 2022 is well underway. And even though many felt that last year was a very good year in the Metro Edmonton real estate market, things are looking even better this year already. Yeah, it's not crazy like some parts of the country. We we talked to somebody in Ottawa last week. It's insane there, but it's pretty good right now here. Yeah, it's a great time to start gearing up if you're starting to think about looking for a new place or maybe even putting your place on the market because people are looking already. Interest is high to buy inventory. And uh, also the inventory in the market is low at this time of year, which is totally the norm. So anyway, I'm encouraging you to get a hold of the group at the Macintosh Group at Remax River City. Yeah, it's uh, it's real simple to find them too. 780-464-0075 or macintoshgroup.ca. But start the process going right now. They'll give you a complimentary evaluation of your current home. There's no obligation, no deadline for this offer. So if you're really thinking about it, don't let the market pass you by. Now is a great time to get a hold of them. Both buyers and sellers can contact the McIntosh Group at REMAX River City. Once again, that phone number, 780-464-0075, or find them at mcintoshgroup.ca. And one last thing, when you talk to them, tell them the outsider sent you. Hey, I don't know if it's just me, but and I posted this on my Twitter account. I can't remember an Olympics that I watched less than this last one in Beijing, and I and I and I posted it saying that I I I hardly watched, and there were some really wonderful things that happened for Canada, like the ladies' hockey club. Sorry, some of the ladies don't like to be called ladies. The women's hockey team. Okay, so uh, so there's that. Uh, They played great. They were fabulous. There were some other achievements, but I hardly noticed. And I, and I, if you told me that I'd hardly watch the winter Olympics after being so ferocious in the way I've watched the Olympics in the past, I I would have been horrified. I, I was trying to figure out exactly why is it? Well, the time zone was a factor. There's a lot of other stuff going on in the world right now. Like what's happening with Ukraine and Russia, what's been happening in Canada with everything that's been going on in Ottawa and across the country. We've got COVID still hanging around. And, uh, you know, now we're dropping a lot of the mandates, that kind of thing. Hey, Robin, we could go on and on and on about the reason why we didn't watch the Olympics very much. I'll be fascinated to see what the TV ratings are. But it used to be a TV bonanza. And for me, this time around, it just wasn't. What about for you? 
Well, you're not, you're not alone. I mean, I, I feel exactly the same way and, and it, it, it just stands to reason. So do a lot of other people. Um, I'm not down on the Olympics, uh, but the timing of it, uh, it doesn't work. There's a lot of other re- important real life stuff going on. And I don't think you just at the end of the day, well, let's turn on the tube and watch the, uh, you know, watch them play this sport or that sport. This is the last couple of years have been a real challenge for everybody. Um, And a lot of reasons for that. You can talk about some of the political stuff, the stuff that's brewing with Russia and the Ukraine. That's on people's minds. The uh, occupation of Ottawa by this freedom convoy, the border crossing blockades. I don't even care about the politics. It is an unnerving time for a lot of people. When you look out your window, there was a woman on the news last night saying how blessed she felt just that she could come out of her condo and walk down a street that had been, you know, previously, it's no big deal. It's your neighborhood. Well, all of a sudden when that's taken away, you go, Hmm, uh, you notice it. So there's a lot of little big and little uh, upheavals going on around the world where it just gets lost in the shuffle. And I think a lot of people too are concerned about the pandemic. And there was a reasonable argument to be made that maybe they should have not held the games at all. That was seen by some as punitive uh, to the athletes. And I can't disagree with that. Right. But a lot of reasons. It just, you know what, if, if people want to do it, um, they will do it. So if, if the viewership is not there, that just tells you that there was more important things going on in their lives. And I would be very surprised if that's not the case when the numbers do come out. And another thing that's got to be brought up because somebody's going to say, oh, you forgot about the human rights stuff with China and Beijing and yeah. that type of thing. And for some people, I try to keep politics out of it. I just do. I just want to cheer for my country and against other countries in an athletic sport, in the athletic arena. But for some people, that's very important. And I get that. Okay, fine. But it's just, for me, it was, I just, uh, I did, I I can't say tuned out. I just never tuned in. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Hey, let's talk about some NHL hockey stuff. First, we'll talk about the Edmonton Oilers. Jay Woodcroft gets off to a rollicking start. Kind of the wheels fell off a little bit in the third period in Winnipeg and then against Minnesota here, just a block and a half from me at the Road 55 studio. They just uh, they just didn't have anything left. Played a lot of games and a lot of nights, but a lot of teams are doing that right now. But what do you think? Are you seeing some positives or are you worried that the uh, the new car smell has finally started to disappear? Well, it, it wasn't a new car smell the last game out, that's for no, sure. No, no, exactly. Uh, uh, Somebody brought a little fast food into the car. But uh, you know what? Jay Woodcroft is a very thoughtful, uh, uh, he's a thinker. And I like the way he, at least from what we've seen of him, the way he processes the game and the way he believes in in coaching the game. Uh, hey, they had a nice 5-0 and run go, going. Uh, not every coach gets a bounce when, when he comes in and replaces a, somebody who's fired, but there's often a little bit of a bounce. I don't think that, I don't think the five games was just a bounce. I think he's set some things in motion that make sense for the team. A, he's not riding Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl until they're ready to drop. Right. Uh, their young kids are, I mean, they're, they're in the prime of their career. So it's not like poor babies. I mean, they'll, they, they love, Hey, oh, throw me out there. Coach, we'll get it done. They're never going to say you're playing me too much, but it's nice to see that he's aware that you need to get something done with other players and other lines aside from those two guys in the long run, that'll pay off. Uh, I think one thing that's paying off too, Brennan, and I've, I've got to mention it. Uh, just because I was against the move for non-hockey reasons. Uh, the acquisition of Evander Kane. Yes. I don't like the man, what I what we've heard about the man. But if you take that out of it, and it's not my money, and it's not my team. Yeah. So he has allowed, by putting him in that top six, he has allowed Ryan Nugent Hopkins to move down and give them that third center and that's made a difference that gives a coach more cards uh that he can play so that's been good uh 
the goaltending remains well, flip a coin. Is Mike Smith going to be great? Is he going to be terrible? He's been terrible lately. Uh, what about Koskinen? Same thing. Uh, Stuart Skinner's the wild card there. I'd like to see more of him, but... But he doesn't make enough money. Let's talk about that for a second. You always want to play the guys that are making the big coin. I It kind of drives me a little crazy because for me, Skinner has been very, very reliable. But the problem is you have to justify the fact that you're paying this player X amount of dollars and that player paying X. Am I reading too much into that? Yeah, you are. I don't think the coaches give a shit about that. They're going to play the players who they believe give them the best chance to win. The only caveat in that is if the GM knocks on the coach's door and says, Hey, you're making me look bad. In this case, Jay, uh, the guy we got sitting in the press box is making six mil per uh, what's going on. Yeah. You might have that conversation, but really from a coaching point of view, who gives you the best chance to win? Who fits into your lineup the best? You know, Skinner was down back down in, in Bakersfield for a bit there. Uh, they need him to play. I just think moving forward, he's their best bet. Uh of the of the three who are here now, I don't see Koskinen being re-signed. If we're if we look a bit further down the road than the stretch drive, I don't see it. Um, Mike Smith, he's on for another year at least on paper. Uh, will we see the old Mike Smith uh, down the stretch? Maybe he was. He's been very good at times. Uh, or will we just see the old old Mike Smith, where age catches up to everybody? I don't know. Long range, they need to address goaltending with a new body in there somewhere. Maybe somebody to go with Skinner. I don't see if if Koskinen and Smith are both still here next season. Well, they've got a problem. Yeah, they do, problem. you're absolutely right. And and back to Evander Kane for a second. I view him nothing more now as a rental. The better he plays this season, the less chance they're going to have of signing him because they just don't have the wiggle room. So I, if somebody's thinking about running out and getting an Evander Kane jersey. With an Oilers logo on the front, I think I would hang tight on that for a little bit. Uh, if he's if he's that good, Bryn, they might find a way. They'll have to. Uh, and one last thing on the Oilers, and then I want to talk about the Calgary Flames for a couple of minutes, and and that is uh, Dave Tippett is a yeah. great guy, mm-hmm. and it bothers me when people are slagging him on his way out the door. Uh, yeah. I always say, hey, listen, things change, coaches change, but you know it doesn't change. Whether or not you're a good guy or not, and Dave Tippett to me is one of the good guys in hockey, and it sounds like I saw a report out of uh, out of Arizona that he's actually thinking of retiring and yeah. enjoying his uh, his life away from the game. To which I say, good for you, Dave. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, big thumbs up for me uh, as to uh, the kind of guy that he is. Uh, sorry that it ended the way it did, but you know the old deal with coaches: you're hired to be fired, right? Yeah, and you know what? We've talked about this in different aspects, Bryn, whether it's some of the stuff, man, less important media puts up with. There seems to be a lot of anger out there right now in general. And maybe that's because there's a lot of angst out there now with what's ha- been happening in the world. Yeah. But yeah, if you guys, yeah, there's no need to crap on a guy on the way out of town. I always thought, and there's not too many guys in the media that have done that, but the guys are trying to get the, the last shots in as the guy's reaching city limits. I always thought that was kind of chicken shit, especially if it was a media guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fans, you know, they're going to say what they want. And I get, you know, you pay your dollar, you get to holler, but it also looks kind of crass and, and boorish to, uh, dump on a guy no matter what. You know, Dave Tippett uh, has been a very good coach in this league. Uh, you know, he's 60. He hasn't needed to work for a long time. If he wants to go tinker with cars uh, or do what he likes to do, go into the sunset and enjoy life. There's more. You know what? Some people wouldn't don't believe this. I, Ken Hitchcock, I think, is one of them. There's more to life than yeah. uh, being inside a hockey ring. Nothing wrong if that's your, it's your Breaking call. down a power play is everything to Hitch. <laughs> Hitch is going to go till they, till they just have to carry him out. I yeah. mean, that's just, but you know what? Good luck to Tip. He's always, he's been a terrific guy. As he, I found out a terrific guy and a young coach. He remember, he was coaching some of those teams in Dallas 
uh, after Hitch when there were all those, uh, uh, you know, those six playoff years in a row. And I've got a great picture of him in the scrum when he's in the, still the, the black hair mustache. Oh, yeah. Days. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what? He's going to be fine if he wants to coach again. He'll land a gig of some sort. Uh, and if he wants to just ride off into the sunset, enjoy. Uh, you've earned it. Uh, you know, good for him. Big win for the Calgary Flames over the Winnipeg Jets the other night. A uh, couple of late goals in the last couple of minutes. And mm-hmm. it uh, earned Daryl Sutter 10 straight victories. So 10 and counting at the recording of this podcast. He has that team playing exceptionally well. They've got great goaltending. The defense plays exactly the way they have to play. And the forwards are playing a nice blend of moving forward and scoring goals and waiting for other teams to make mistakes and also playing defense. Daryl's really got those guys cruising, and they are a Stanley Cup contender right now, Robin. Well, I tell you what, and and we've we've talked about this before, Bryn. I, I am surprised it didn't happen right away, but when I look at the team, he inherited from Jeff Ward last season. Yeah. It, you know, they haven't turned the roster upside down, but there's been change. And I think this is more of a team that can play the way that Daryl wants them to play. Um, I've never had a doubt about his ability as a coach. He's, you know, in many ways, he's old school and he's a hard ass, hard nosed kind of guy, uh, at least in, demeanor if you actually have ever sat down and had a chat with him and you have and i have he's got a distinct feelings about the way the game should be played but he, he's also got that wry smile and that sense of humor and uh you know good good for him i i've said it before and i'll say it again the best thing that we can have uh as people who cover hockey and for the fans who care about hockey uh, in this province is really good teams in Calgary and in Edmonton. Uh, We all know how that goes when they're both really good. It's been a long time since that was the case. So, hey, uh, I'm real happy to see how well the Flames are doing down there. Did I ever tell you the story about Daryl Sutter? He returned to Calgary. It wasn't very – the ending in Calgary before I got there wasn't, uh, wasn't very pleasant. So now I'm working in Calgary at uh, Sportsnet 960, The Fan, and I'm hosting the Flames broadcasts. So I'm working out of the, uh, the studio downstairs, right outside of the visitor's locker room. And it's that one day, as soon as he got hired by the Los Angeles Kings to come in and coach, everybody in Calgary, one, they cringed, and then they immediately looked, when's he in town? When's he in town? And, of course, it was, I still remember the date, the 15th of January. So it was circle on the calendar by everybody. And they went, oh, boy. They just hated the way it had gone with Daryl and Calgary at the end. Yeah. So anyway, on that particular day, it was a Saturday night hockey night in Canada game. I remember that vividly as well. And I used to get down to, uh, to uh, the hot stove lounge. And uh, on a Saturday, I'd always get down there very early. I'd read the newspaper. We had a couch in there and a nice coffee pot. And, you know, it, it was like a little mini home type thing. And mm-hmm. the thing I remember was I had the door open. And this is like two hours before anybody would even show up. And I, I hear this, uh, hi, how are you? And I look up and it's Daryl. And, of course, I'd heard all the horror stories. So immediately I go, oh, my God, what am I going to do here? So I said, oh, come on in. Would you like a coffee? Oh, sure, sure. So I made him a coffee. And without even having to ask him, he just sat down on one of the other couches. And we started to shoot the shit a little bit. And then we started talking. We didn't even talk about hockey initially. We talked about how's it, you know, because he'd been up on he'd been up on the farm in Viking. And I said, how was the, the Viking thing before jumping back into this? And he said, oh, man, we got a coyote problem right now. And he was talking about coyotes and how you know the uh you know the, the he says you have to guard the little calves who just been born out in the field from the coyotes to say well how would you even know they're there and he said well you shine your flashlight around the perimeter of the property in their eyes he says you can see the coyotes eyes so you always knew that you're gonna have to be up all night and he went on and on about this story which i was fascinated by he was great <laughs> he was absolutely fantastic to talk to but what i found out later was that he was very close to all of the support people at the Saddle Dome. Like he knew, you know, Joe and Bill at the gate downstairs. He knew Esther who ran the concessions and he knew like he knew all these support people. He yep. struggled with the media. 
uh, and struggle with some of the fans, but everybody who put in an honest effort in the building that you never even think about, he went around that day and made sure that he said, said hi to Esther or Bill and Steve at the gate. He came in. The reason why he came in early is he just wanted to get, he wanted to make the rounds in the building to, to kind of reconnect with everybody. And I, I got a lot of respect for a guy like that. It, it, it really made a mark for me. That's why I remember it so much. Well, and just a short mention for me, Brent, along, along the same lines, I don't know why I was down at the shark tank early, uh, one day, I think the oiler, we got into town and, and the team was going to have a skate so the guys could get loose. So it was a couple days before the game. I wandered in and I saw the coach's office door open and, and Daryl was in there with his son. And, yes. Uh, uh, he waved me in and uh, I went in. I tell you, I, we, we were in there for an hour just shooting the breeze and while well, his son uh, played with some stuff, the, some toys that were in there. Yeah, it was almost like it was a little, a little uh, daddy daycare center there for, for a, a while. And you know, there's none of that edge that you get. And the when, if you only see NHL coaches and players for that matter in a post game setup where they're either elated or pissed off uh, because they won or they lost, and the adrenaline is still flowing uh, a little bit that's a totally different animal than sitting down with them away from the battle. Yeah. Uh, and, and just chatting and, you know, uh, coaches look one way behind the bench because that's their livelihood. And they look another way when you get them and you just sit down and shoot the breeze. And I don't know how much, I don't even remember how much we talked hockey. Uh, probably hour. very little because I, I don't remember talking hockey at all when he was sitting in there for 45 minutes. Yeah, but it was it was it was wonderful. And then I went out and sat and watched the eighteen thousandth optional skate that I'd yeah. ever watched, and I probably would have had more fun had I stayed in the office for another hour. But yeah, um, you know what? Um, the setters are the setters are just so solid. Anybody who knows them. Uh, understands that. Yeah. And I don't care if he's in Calgary or San Jose or LA, uh, he's going to have a hockey club that wants to uh, compete play for him. Yeah. And as hard assed as he is, and he can wear guys down if they're, if they're oh, yeah. not uh, with the program, uh, same as Hitch, uh, he's demanding, but you give him what he wants. You're going to be in a good place as a hockey player. He's a good man. I'm totally with you there. Okay. And as I said, 10 wins and counting. Uh, they are looking scary right now. We'll see. We'll see how it shakes down over the next two months. Hey, uh, that's pretty much it for the episode today. Make sure you check us out on Twitter. The handle's really simple. It's at Outsiders2020. Also, make sure you tell your friends to subscribe to our RSS feed on any of your favorite ear candy sites like Apple, Google, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Deezer. There's a whole ton of them. You know where they're out there. Uh, also, we're on YouTube. You get an audio version. You get to look at our you get to look at our cartoon version of me and Robin while you're listening to us on YouTube. Robin records at the luxurious studio in the southwest part of Edmonton. Still don't have a name for it, Robin. No name. No. no Come name. on, not just like the place. By the way, your lighting is a lot better today. I got to say. Well, I tell you what, you know, you're going to find that as spring approaches, Bryn. I know you're you're absolutely right. Daylight saving time is not that far off. I'm recording from the Road 55 studio in downtown Edmonton. I'm a block and a half from Roger's place. It's really close. Your support is greatly appreciated. Make sure, do us one favor, though. This is a really big thing for us, and it's really been noticeable. When you retweet to your buds our podcast, it our audience continues to surge, and that is just great. And we also have to thank Brent and everybody at uh, the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City for their support. That's it for today. Thanks, Robin. We'll talk to you next week. You sure will, pal. Bye-bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. Road 55.